Jeff, Sarah, welcome to the stage. Um, just to set the stage for the discussion, uh, tell us really briefly about your company, how old it, um, just in terms of how long it's been around, when did it go public, and how has it been since the IPO? Great, why don't I kick it off? So Square, we are seven years old. Uh, we went public last year, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, today, to give you a sense, Square started by fixing the problem that every seller faces, which is how to accept every payment that comes across their countertop or comes to them in a mobile environment. From there, we've grown into a full commerce platform, so a very fully featured point of sale. We help you manage your customers, your payroll. We offer you loans to help you start, run, and grow your business. Today, we have millions of sellers on the platform. We'll process about $50 billion across Square in 2016. Um, and we've enjoyed a good year post our IPO. Great. Jeff. Yeah, so Twilio is a cloud communications platform. We let developers build applications that communicate, whether via voice, text, video, and more. And our mission is really to allow software developers to build the future of communications, which is in software. We started the company in 2008, so uh, what are we, eight years ago, almost nine years ago now, uh, because I'm a software developer. I had wanted communications and many of the apps that I had built prior to starting the company, and every time I found communications was this completely esoteric realm, inaccessible to a developer, uh, and so we started Twilio to solve that problem, bringing communications into the era of software and empowering every software developer on the planet to have communications in their tool belt so that when they find problems at work that need communications to solve, they're able to pull out Twilio and solve them. So when did you go public? We went public in June of this year. Okay, so both of you had very different paths to an IPO. Square was one of the most, uh, the best known of the unicorns. Your CEO, Jack Dorsey, was on the cover of virtually every magazine. There was a tremendous amount of scrutiny on the company, and you went public. Twilio is almost the opposite. You were known to your customers and your investors, and nobody else knew about you. I need to grow a beard, that's why. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> so how, how did those two different paths affect how you decided to go public? Yeah, you know, it's interesting for us, you're right. I mean, we're, you know, developers are our audience, and we've always focused on reaching developers of the world. And even though people use Twilio all the time, you know, last year, Twilio reached over a billion devices on the planet that we interacted with on behalf of all the apps built on Twilio, yet so many people don't know that we're powering those communications. And, you know, for the most part, we're okay with that, because developers are really who we want to reach. But at the same time, as you build a B2B business, um, uh, building trust with your customers and building awareness about the company just helps you build a bigger and better company. Um, and, uh, and so as we broaden out the circles of the types of people we're interacting with, because developers are, for example, bringing us into the enterprise. And so more and more people are getting exposed to Twilio who aren't the initial developers who are the ones who are uh, starting to use Twilio and as they bring us in. Uh, so building that awareness is helpful, and, and an IPO is a great way to, um, to build more awareness about the company. And so we did think about that as we were heading into the IPO as a, as a means of increasing the awareness of Twilio. Uh, because, you know, public companies just get more visibility, and the IPO process itself is a really good, you know, it's a really good marketing event in a lot of ways. So Sarah, you had plenty of visibility. Um, how did your very public path to being a public company uh, develop? Sure, so for us, the IPO was definitely a credentializing moment. So we could have fundraised many different ways, but what we felt an IPO brought was a level of transparency into who Square was, how well we were doing, that really helped kind of get rid of all of the rumor and speculation that had surrounded us. It's important because we're in a regulated interest industry. We're disrupting financial services, and, and we are a fintech company. And so because of that, for our regulators, for the governments we work for, with the banks we work with, the networks and so on, it was good to be able to put the full financial profile of Square out into the public domain and kind of show how strong we were, both from a balance sheet perspective, but also from a growth and a revenue perspective. I think beyond that, our sellers are small businesses, but they are you know, incredibly, um, like they live every day having to know about their business, and so they were intrigued by our business. And so I think it was important for our customers too 
to see Square take that next big step forward. It was a great marketing moment. We really brought our sellers into our IPO. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Even for our uh, unveiling on NASDAQ, we actually did it outside the exchange. We did it through a tap on our reader, which was pretty cool, for the first Square seller, um, a flower shop called Lillibell. So we actually had Lillibell nice. come. And actually, it was our sellers who were most excited that day, closely followed by our employees. So, but that made it worthwhile. So when you say you brought them in, you allowed them to buy shares at the IPO? Well, yes, but we brought them into the event itself. So we had people cutting hair, we had people selling flowers, we had people selling food. But we also allowed them to buy, just like a big institution, they got to buy at the IPO price itself. And interestingly, a year later in that DSP, that distributed share program, we still see about 80% have held, which is incredible stickiness. It shows how much they're bought into our success and our story because it's how they're going to be successful too. Interesting. So for both of you, what was the moment or the, the event or the, the stage in the company where you said, OK, we're ready to go public? So I would say for Square, because we've been heavily regulated and we've been audited by states and governments and banks and so on, we built the company from the get-go to be public company ready. So I don't think there was like a moment where we said, okay, now is the time. Certainly in the four and a half years now, so three and a half years pre-IPO that I'd been there, we'd always built, we call it like build to last, because we knew that we had to become a really big company at scale that could be trusted and could be regulated. So we felt ready for, I think, many years prior to the IPO. Yeah, for us, it was similar. I mean, I think we didn't focus on any particular outcome in the early years of the company, right? We were just focusing on building because, you know, we always talked about internally the idea that, you know, the first step is, of course, building a company that is worth taking public, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's job number one. Um, and at some point when we had reached, you know, around the $100 million of revenue run rate, well, that's when we started thinking about, like, okay, you know, you're in the scale where, you know, companies do go public, and that's when we started investing in the readiness efforts. And, you know, we always phrased it as, hey, you know, our goal isn't to go public, and we're not here in order to do this, yeah. but, you know, one day, you know, that may be something, what we want to do. And let's be realistic, right? We took venture capital, so we know that one day we expect to make a return for those investors. Um, and so we're going to start investing in readiness and the processes and controls and all the things that you need to have in place in order to be able to one day say, yes, now is the time. We want to go public. And what we wanted was, you know, to be able to say, hey, the company is ready. You know, maybe the markets seem ready. Like, the time feels right. We didn't want to start the timer then and say, okay, now it's going to be 18 to 24 months before we're ready. We always wanted to be ready, you know, roughly when we felt the business and, you know, everything else was aligned. Uh, and so we'd started that process, you know, about 24, 36 months ago, just to make sure that we were ready. And the way we talked about it internally was, we're building these processes and controls, not in order to go public, but because doing so builds a stronger company, similar to what Sarah was saying. It's like, these are the things you do to build an operationally excellent company anyway. Yeah. And the added benefit is, then we have ball control that one day if we decide that going public is the thing we want to do, we'll be able to do it. Yeah. So there's... And, and by the way, I think it's important that you're not just building to an event because you've got this whole decades post the event. Yeah. So it can be very jarring for employees if everything is focused on this one moment instead of it just being you know, a milestone on the journey. Okay. Let me get the... Uh, I'll follow up on that in a moment. But so did you feel the... The IPO helped you to prove something to your customers or to your stakeholders. You know, with, with um, Square, for a while, there was a lot of uh, questions about your financial viability. You, Jeff, once told me you didn't want to be known as a fly-by-night unicorn. Um, so, so it's kind of what I said. <laughs> it, it is what you said. So what did the IPO prove, do you think, to your stakeholders? I think for Square, it proved that we were incredibly strong from a financial perspective, from a momentum perspective, and it brought it into the open some of the real uniqueness of our business. So I think even to this day, people find it hard in a way to pinpoint us. You know, are you a payments company? Are you a point of sale company? You know, are you a CRM company? Like, what is it that you do? And I think by being able to kind of tell our story holistically, 
we could show that we're a technology company at heart, right? We're built on strong engineers, building great data science on top of all the data that we see as effectively the merchant of record for millions of small businesses, right? We'd be easily a top 10 merchant in the United States. And so I think it allowed that story to be told much more clearly than when others were telling that story for us. And so that's what I actually love about being a public company, is we're in charge now of telling that story. We get to step up in front of Wall Street every quarter, show our discipline, show what we're doing, um, and not be told from others what our business is doing. Yeah, similar here, you know, I, I believe in when your business is in the cloud, whether that is you know, infrastructure like Twilio, whether it's a SaaS application like Salesforce, whether it's payments like, like um, uh, Square, the, the, what you're essentially, your primary thing you're selling to your customers is trust. Like trust is the number one thing you're selling because what you're really asking your customers to do is to say, hey, you know, hand over a piece of your company to us and trust that we're going to do it better than, say, you could do it yourself or that you could do it with some other vendor. Trust us with that piece of your business. And when you do that, trust is more important than almost anything else, any other feature or any other part of what you're doing. And we felt that by going public, what a great way to continually increase the trust you have with your customers. And um, you know, that's for two reasons, primarily. You know, one is they get to look into your business, right? Every quarter, you're reporting. They get to see the strength of your balance sheet. They get to see the health of the business, what the investments you're making. Um, you become an open book to them. And the second thing is that everybody knows that a public company is just run as a tighter ship than a private company. It has to be. You've got auditors, you've got investors, you've got stock exchanges. I mean, everybody is there to make sure that you're running a tight ship. And that helps to increase customer trust as well. And I really liked that aspect of going public because that's how you accelerate your leadership role. And that's how you show that, hey, you know, you can trust us. And in fact, we are an incredibly trustworthy platform for you to be building on is an incredibly important part of, of being in the cloud. So I, I love that part of it. So today there's a lot of companies, a lot of unicorns or not unicorns, but companies that are where you were six months ago, where you were a year, year and a half ago. Some may be worried about going public because they might not be worth their um, last valuation. In, in your case, you went public below your last mm -hmm. private market valuation. I think you went right around that valuation. W what's your advice for, for companies? Should they, should they you know, what should they think about when they think about going public? And I think you have to start from the principle of why. Why are you doing it? So there are reasons, you know, do you need to raise money? And is this the best avenue? Right? There's still a lot of private money available. Um, do you need liquidity, whether it's for your shareholders or your employees? So in the case of younger companies, both Twilio totally and Square, right, we're still very young. So our investors are not looking for an immediate exit. So there's less pressure, I think, there. I think from an employee standpoint, you have to be mindful of liquidity. But there are ways to get that, like doing, we did a tender offer while we were still private, for example. I think. If you get through those and you still like say, okay, this is still viable, then I actually think it is about the, what do you get from it that really helps move your business forward? Like everything you do in your business has to be about like, is it going to drive the business forward? Like don't do busy work. So is it credentializing? Is it bringing some new information to my customer base? Like I would focus on that much more than caring about, you know, private market valuations or what's the world going to think of you. Like if you get that inside your head, you start making really bad business decisions. So I think focusing on how's it going to drive your business forward to help your customers, like that's when IPOs are interesting. Yeah, I'm with her. That was well <laughs> the, I mean, I, I, the external reasons to do it are the most important ones. Yeah. To help you build a better relationship with your customers, with, you know, employees, like, like the things that are going to help you build a stronger business 5, 10, 15 years from yeah. now, those are the reasons to go public. And some of the other reasons that are more like inner, in, toward, inwardly focused, you know, about your investors or about your valuation or whatever, I think if those are major decision points for you, mm -hmm. that you may, be, you may be thinking about the wrong things or you may be over-optimizing for the short term. Okay, a question just for you, Jeff, as CEO. How has your role changed now that you're a public company CEO? Yeah, it's funny. You know, a lot of people ask me that. I even had somebody ask me shortly after the IPO, someone in technology, they said, what are you going to do next? And I said, 
run a public company? I mean, like, <laughs> this is the beginning, right? A lot of people think IPOs are somehow like the end or something. Like, Sure, but, but like you must be spending a lot of time. You have to prepare for quarterly well, earnings. You have to do stuff you didn't have to do before, right? Th there's a little bit of that. Uh, you know, probably takes, you know, maybe a couple of days or a quarter. But for the most part, I have a litmus test, right? which was if I'm not focused on the same things I was focused on as a private company, which are customers, product, and team, if I find that those aren't still my focus, I'm doing it wrong. Because those are the things you need to build a great company, whether you're private or public. And by the way, it's even more important when you're public. So uh, a follow-up question for your teams, you know, how has going public changed the company and how do you keep your teams focused on building the company and not on what's happening in the stock market and when do I cash out or not? Or it, it's hard one when, I mean, depending on how you built your company. So we built our company under kind of supreme transparency. So pre going public, we shared every metric. It's actually part of, I think, what helped us get through some of the wild ride we took in the press because people internally had access to all of our numbers. So they knew we were never as good as they said we were or as bad. So there was a much more kind of just straight down the middle way of managing our employees. As a public company, clearly we have to be more careful about sharing material non-public information, m and I hate that phrase because it just comes up all the time. And so it's trying to strike the balance of how do we still keep you know, inordinate transparency, and I think we really do lean heavily into that, um, while still making sure that we're not putting employees in difficult situations when it comes to trading the stock. So I think that's the hardest thing. And then just being really honest with employees about if they want to talk about the stock, we do Q&A session right after earnings. Um, and at that point, that's the one time when we will have a conversation about generally, you know, what's our stock doing. But outside of that, it's, Jack actually will say, don't focus on the stock totally the wrong thing. Like, you can't change how the stock will trade. You can only change the fundamentals of the business. So that means you need to focus on shipping the best products, managing to hire and retain the best team. And if we get those two things right, then, you know, the fundamentals will trend up and the stock will do what it needs to do. Jeff, I think you, uh, on the day of the IPO, you distributed shirts that said day one. Yeah, we, we put up shirts that said day one. To make the point, right, this is not the end, this is the beginning, and we're the beginning of the days as a public company using that public stature as a platform for the next stage of growth. And I played around with a lot of ways to try to make this point to the employees. You know, I thought about, you know, putting up the, the share price of Amazon from the day they went public to today, right, and saying like, hey, if you don't believe me, it's day one, like, check out a few companies where I can just show you the day one-ness of their stock price. But, you know, I actually thought it was really interesting to use our own um, our own dynamics as an example. And, and I made the point, because sometimes you tell people, you know, don't focus on the stock price. You can't affect it. But it's, it's really hard to internalize that, like, don't focus, like, why wouldn't I focus on it? It's always there, right? It's always this scoreboard I get to look at and decide if we're winning or not. And, and so I made the point to our company, I said, you know, we spent, you know, we, uh, uh, we went public, you know, the stock price was $15 uh, in the offering. And, you know, at the end of like the first day of trading it was close to 30. And our, our range on our cover was, you know, uh, 12 to 14. So I was like, hey, everybody, like we were priced 12 at the beginning of last week and, and, and the day we went public, we were 15. Like what made us worth, you know, 25% more? Anybody, anybody? Like, are we 25% smarter than we were last week? No. And by the way, it took us eight years to build up that much value. Do you really think we're that much better one week later? Right? And then you accentuate that with, and you sort of say, what changed about our company between that $12 and that $15? And the room, we were all hands, the room was silent. Like, I was looking around, scratching my head. They said, nothing. I said, oh, okay. And so what's different between the $15 company and the, like, $30 company? And people looked around and said, nothing, right? And so what in the long term, the things you focus on about value creation for customers, that over the long arc of time creates value in the share price. Yep. But any sufficiently short period of time, a matter of days or weeks, right, especially when there's no new information about your company in that period of time, like yeah. there's nothing new right. that would legitimately change your price. You're like, that is unrelated to the work we do every day. Yeah. Because it can't be related because there's no new information about our company between those periods of time. 
And that, may, that helped the point to get across, I think, to a lot of people to realize, oh yeah, you're right. Like, why, why would that have changed? Why would the value we created in the last eight years have been doubled in the last week? So stay focused. There's no reason. Stay focused then. Yep. Jeff, Sarah, we're flat out of time. Thanks very much for a great conversation. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Miguel.